time, weather, and... Always pass. Greetings. Today we will look at just how destructive to the Earth's ecology dogs can be and are. But first, we will listen to a short audio clip from an old film. Before that, a bit of context for what we are about to hear. In Chapter 7 of the book, The Dog Crisis, author Iris Nowell writes the following. In the 1950s, before meat sources other than beef, lamb, or sheep had to be specified on the label. The wild horse population was decimated by the use of horse meat in canned pet food. Whale meat was a major raw material until the early 1970s when public outcry prohibited its use. As of 1968, herring shoals have been fished almost out of existence since half the world's fish catch is being fed to animals. Here she is primarily referring to household pets, which mostly means cats and dogs, and primarily dogs. This chapter is titled, The Social Costs of Pets and touches on such aspects as livestock and wildlife destruction by dogs, as well as the threat to the ecosystem which pet ownership, and particularly the overpopulation of dogs even back during that time, presented. Also worthy of note is Chapter 5. In a section titled Unfit for Human Consumption, she writes the following as well. Where were all the animal lovers as far back as the 1920s and 30s? when half a million horses were slaughtered annually to feed pets. Marilyn Monroe was never more beautiful or sensitive than in The Misfits when she realizes that Clark Gable and his pals are running down wild Mustangs with their trucks to sell them for slaughter. We'll tie down the other three on the way back. How much do you think this mare will weigh, Gato? About 600 pounds, I guess. Well, it must be about 400 on that brown, huh? Just about, yeah. Must be about 800 on the stadium. Oh, a little light. It'd be about 1,900, 2,000 pounds. Well, how does that all come out? Well, six cents a pound. It'd be about 110, 120 dollars. How do you want to cut it up? Any way you like. I'll pay 50 for myself on the plane. Okay. I ought to have about 40 for the truck and me. That leaves 25 for you, Purse. That all right? Purse! No, you... You fellas take it. I just came along for the ride anyway. Even if dogs were docile like the capybara of the Pantanal, which of course they are not, their widespread ownership would still wreak havoc on the planet. It is worth pausing to reflect on the fact that the catastrophic ecological impacts of dog ownership due to their overpopulation were noted as far back as the late 1970s. I am of course referring to the aforementioned book which I referenced in this episode, the dog crisis, and if it was called a crisis nearly half a century ago, what is it today? After all, dogs are even more severely overpopulated today, and all issues recognized decades ago have only gotten worse since then. Dog nutters really don't like hearing things like this, but the more dogs there are, the more industries will extract raw materials from the earth in order to provide the things dogs need and the things their nutter owners want to provide them. This includes food and medicine, but goes well beyond basic necessities. Dog supplies also include dog toys and various luxury items made exclusively for dogs. Many of these are things dogs could never appreciate, and which they certainly do not need. Examples include fancy dog beers, on which every effort is utterly wasted on dogs. 
but dog supplies also include crates, beds, muzzles and harnesses, and all the rest of it. And we should not neglect to mention the fact that the existence of dogs also entails the necessity for products used to deter and repel dogs, such as dog repellent sprays for gardens, anti-barking devices, and many self-defense tools which plenty of people only invest in because of dogs. The most significant consequence of pet ownership results from the production and distribution of meat-based pet foods. That is because this requires the usage of various resources. Among the factors of production involved are land and labor. It requires space, energy, water and various raw materials. Facilities must exist to house products being stored. Those products must be transported as well. All of this processing generates a tremendous carbon dioxide, or CO2, output. All of that food it takes such effort and resource usage to produce is ultimately just turned into waste. The typical dog generates 0.75 pounds of waste per day, as per the Environmental Protection Agency. The bags used to collect the waste contribute around 0.6% of global plastic waste and leaving the dung there is just as detrimental to human health and local environments. Dog urine cannot be picked up off the ground, now can it? As noted previously, all forms of dog waste are terrible for soil and groundwater and bacteria from dog waste manages to find its way into the air we breathe and public drinking supply reservoirs. Dog excrement can often be found in areas where children play and where people go for exercise and where a wide diversity of plants and wildlife naturally exist. Of course, we shouldn't allow this open defecation and urination at all to begin with, and we never should have. Even if there is only one dog in a massive apartment complex, that single dog is still going to be spreading nastiness around on a daily basis. But once again, what we have on our hands is beyond a crisis. It's bad enough we allow this, but even managing it causes significant problems. In the United States alone, pets collectively produce the same amount of feces per year as some 90 million humans, which is roughly 5.1 million tons. According to one peer-reviewed estimate, 25% of animal protein raised in the United States goes to household pets, which is primarily dogs. Owning a medium-sized dog can have a similar carbon footprint to one or two large SUVs. From the standpoint of safety, all large dogs present a credible threat of serious bodily harm. Even if we only eliminated large dogs, the general public would be far safer from dog attacks. But in addition to this, the absence of large dogs would also greatly reduce the amount of pet food production that is engaged in, and it would cut down significantly on tons and tons of feces and litres of urine excreted into the environment. The ethics of dog ownership are often presented in abstraction, and from some postulated alternate model of reality, where dogs are falsely projected as harmless, even beneficial. Many pro-dog ideologues actively ignore the various social ills and harms dogs impose, but the worst among them will go so far as to defend the dog's impositions on society and nature, and will even characterize the dog's ravenous expeditions as acceptable, even natural and righteous. This is completely neglectful of the inherent threat of potential violence and wanton wastefulness which is guaranteed by the mere presence of many types of dogs and all dogs collectively. Free roaming by a dangerous fanged predator with a tendency to spread disease, by which of course I mean the common street and house dog, is seen by many as the beast's birthright. Dogs polluting neighborhoods with their incessant barking or them encroaching upon nature are paradoxically viewed by some as natural activities. To have this view requires one of two things. One, total ignorance of basic reality, namely with regard to the nature of dogs as unnatural man-made abominations. Or two, a lot of cognitive dissonance. Dogs are classified as an invasive species and would never have appeared anywhere in the natural world absent human intervention. When owning something as dangerous as a dog, you should have far more obligations to do so in a conscientious manner. 
And let's not forget that unlike the gun, the dog has a will of its own in addition to being a source of much potential injury. But it is abundantly clear that many dog owners want the perceived right or ability to own a dog or many of them. What they don't want is the many responsibilities which even many dog apologists say automatically come with dog ownership. And make no mistake, dogs dropped off in the wild would ruin those areas if they could actually manage to survive. From a BBC article titled, Dogs Becoming Major Threat to Wildlife. They are said to affect wildlife in five general ways. They become predators and kill wild animals, disturb the ecosystem, transmit diseases to wildlife, compete with them for prey, and also interbreed with closely related species. To sum it all up, dogs are not only dangerous to those who own them and those who live with them, whether by choice or not. They are dangerous to others who may come in contact with them as well. And they even produce toxins and threats as byproducts of their existence. They are also environmentally destructive and socially irresponsible to own. And although a lot more can still be said, much has already been written on the subject. Being that dogs are a largely unregulated and popular commodity, they are seeing unbridled proliferation, which is not only reckless, but also quite counter to the ordinary course of nature for animals in the wild, which dogs are actually derived from, although they are not themselves natural at all. But to own a dog is also to condemn many harmless animals to a life of suffering and a brutal death that is basically a sacrifice to the cult of dog. Dog ownership is a completely needless indulgence with numerous severe detrimental side effects and societal impacts, and it unnecessarily contributes to the wholesale slaughter of various farm animals, just so that these artificial so-called pets, which are better described as pests, can survive and spread their numbers. I speak, of course, of the common dog, that child killer and man-eater, that belligerent bully, that wasteful waste which consumes and destroys, and which is only contributing to the filling up of junk heaps and grave sites the world over, that ravenous consumer, that destroyer and defiler of all that is good and healthy, Canis lupus familiaris,